So if you grew up in the 90s, chances are you had one of these Tiger Electronics little handheld devices. This was a one for Jurassic Park, but there were a ton of them. I remember like any movie that came out at the time that was even slightly geared towards kids had one of these. Even IPs like Ninja Turtles, for example, were, were just absolutely covered in Tiger Electronic devices. It was crazy. But the only issue is while Tiger was rolling along, the Game Boy showed up and the Tiger handhelds were getting kind of pushed out of the way. So Tiger decided they had to do something about it and they kind of did. And so the GameCom handheld was born. This was Tiger Electronics competitor to the popular Game Boy handheld from Nintendo. See, the Game Boy had a large advantage over the Tiger handhelds at the time, which were removable cartridges. Those older Tiger devices were generally locked into one game, and you would get some variations like scoring modes, for example, but the Game Boy could change out games easily and was way more advanced than the other handhelds around it at the time, except for the Game Gear, of course, from Sega, which had its own issues. So Tiger decided to introduce the GameCom handheld at E3 1997 and claimed that it would change the gaming world. Later that year in August, it would release with a price of $70 and come with the pack-in cartridge of Lights Out. Leading up to release, Tiger put out several commercials as part of a marketing campaign to show a much more capable device than what was being offered from competitors. The GameCom actually had a full touch screen and could even connect to the internet with the help of a special cartridge. In order to convey this message to gamers, Tiger thought calling their customers idiots was the best option. And it plays more games than you idiots have brain cells! Yeah, they later said this probably wasn't a great idea, definitely didn't make things any easier for them. I looked back through their commercials that aired during the system's release and none of it does a great job selling the handheld or even giving basic information. The commercial that called the customers idiots goes on further to gloss over a ton of questions that actually seem important. Things like, wait, how much does this cost? Or what about compatibility? Those are fairly important questions for a consumer to know ahead of buying it. Any questions? Does it play? Yeah. And the marketing itself was all over the place, much like the handheld. In one sense, they were appealing to the younger audience that was currently playing Game Boy games, and in another, they were touting it as PDA, or PDA functionality, and ability to go online and check emails. This would pretty much be the system's biggest weakness. It just tried to do way too much. Here, let's take a look at the system, and I'll show you exactly what I mean. The GameCom was much larger than the Game Boy, and even the Game Gear, and was hardly a system that would be considered pocket-sized. Keep in mind, at this time, the Game Boy Pocket was introduced, and with the Game Boy only getting smaller, it was really weird to introduce such a massive system. The screen is a 3.5-inch non-backlit display that has a resolution of 200 by 160. Also, as you can probably guess, the screen is black and white, and suffered from some really bad ghosting in games. The audio, however, was one of the strengths leveraging mono output with a total of four audio channels. Many critics were genuinely surprised by some of the sounds coming from the system. Brett Allen Weiss, for example, from All Game, actually wrote, the GameCom constantly amazes me with the strength and scope of its sound effects. On the front, we have what I think is one of the worst D-pads that I've ever used in my life. It just always feels like it's about to pop off at any time during use. It's like a Sega Genesis controller with that rolling D-pad, but with way too much roll. It's pretty much impossible to tell which direction you're pressing and avoiding accidental mispresses is, is impossible. On the right, you have your typical A and B buttons. Rather than jump around in the alphabet, they decided to just go with C and D, so okay, why not? Below that, you have menu, sound, and pause with your on-off button directly at the top. The face buttons press fine and never really give me any issues. It takes a bit getting used to with where the buttons are, and I always found myself looking down to see where each button was. I do mostly write that off to a weird button placement that isn't found, though, on any other system. By now, you may have spotted the stylus situated below the screen. This is, of course, needed because the entire screen is a touchscreen. This really gave people the impression that it was a PDA first and a game device second. It wasn't for another seven years that we would get a look at the DS from Nintendo, so at this time, it was weird to see a touchscreen at all used for a gaming handheld. It's one of those grid-based touchscreens, and the actual grid on the screen can be spotted if you hold it just right and take a look very closely. Otherwise, it works well enough for something made in the 90s, as in you're not going to be signing anything with great accuracy, but it does at least work when pointing to things on the screen. Looking around, we have a power input at the top, along with a COM port that we will touch on a bit more later. 
On the left side, we have volume and contrast, and on the back, we have a battery door where four AA batteries go to power it, and a door that houses a backup battery. Finally, on the right side, we have one of the weirdest quirks this system has to offer. It has two cartridge slots. It's a weird concept since, at first glance, the idea appears unnecessary. However, there was at least a reason for this setup. See, the GameCom was originally supposed to be a more adult Game Boy, and in order for that to work, Tiger needed to go online to provide support for emails. So they released an internet cartridge that would work with a standalone modem. Yeah, that's, that's right. You could connect your GameCom handheld to a full-on modem and get emails. There were at least some cool ideas, though, with games involved. For example, Tiger released a cartridge called the Weblink, and that would allow you to connect your GameCom to your desktop and do things like list your high scores online for your games. There's only one problem. Uh, I said idea because no game ever seemed to actually support that idea. Well, while we're taking a look at the system, we might as well play some games to see how it looks. First, though, let me ask you a question. Have you ever seen a GameCom game sealed? Well, congratulations, now you have. Here, we might as well unbox it while we're at it. They stock these games in these hard plastic cases, which are insanely frustrating to open. This is the type of plastic you need scissors for, and even then, you need to be careful not to accidentally cut the game box. I guess it made it easier to hang on the wall in retail stores, but other games would just stick a hanger to the shrink wrap around the box. Some of the games on the system might actually surprise you. We're unboxing Sonic right now, but they also had games like Resident Evil 2, Jurassic Park, Duke Nukem, Mortal Kombat, and even Batman and Robin. When I read down the list of games, I'll admit I couldn't believe half of these games existed for the system, with Resident Evil 2 probably being the most surprising. We'll look at Resident Evil a little later though in this video, so don't worry. The games come in a standard cardboard box, and inside was a plastic insert that held the tiny cartridge in place. It's quite a bit smaller than a Game Boy game while being a little thicker. Of course, a game wouldn't be complete in the 90s without a printed manual. Yeah, this whole manual situation is kind of a shame. It's got out of hand. We have games that don't come with a manual, we have ones that have advertising instead, and then we have ones, and I'm not even kidding, they come with a piece of paper, this is from Borderlands, that tells you to go and download the manual online. They give you a little URL. They're not even saving, not even saving paper anymore. They, they just don't feel like printing manuals. Anyway, back to the games. First up is Lights Out. This is the game that most GameCom systems came with and is exactly as you would imagine. It's Lights Out. This is a basic game where you try to make the entire grid all one color. Touching a block will change the adjacent blocks to the opposite color. It's a basic puzzle game that already existed as other Tiger Electronic games, so this was a pretty obvious freebie for the system since it was so limited. Next up, we have Sega Fighters Mega Mix, which is a virtual fighter game for the GameCom. Now, this system has ghosting issues and terrible input delay, but the higher-ups said, hey, a fighting game. Yeah, cool, let's put that on there. This might be the worst experience attempting to control a character on screen that I've ever seen. Attempting to roll the D-pad with timing inputs is clumsy, and because the screen has such serious ghosting issues, it's hard to even see what your fighter is doing most of the time. It's just not a good experience at all. I have to imagine most people would play this thing for 10 minutes and just move on. Sonic Jam was the only Sonic game on the system and was actually a compilation of Sonic 2, 3, and Sonic and & Knuckles, which is actually a pretty cool idea. You could even pick between Sonic, Knuckles, and Tails when you start. The only issue is the game itself, it has to start right after the character select screen and uh, Oh boy, the whole point of Sonic games is to go fast. Sega marketed an entire made-up phrase blast processing on the concept, so imagine my surprise when I started playing a choppy, unresponsive version on the GameCom. Yeah, this is really bad. The inputs are delayed, it has worse ghosting than the Game Gear, and even the sound effects are strangely delayed from what's going on on screen. I'm starting to get an idea as to why this thing didn't sell. Resident Evil was the last game I tested, and it was the one that I was most intrigued with. How in the world could they fit such a big game onto a GameCom cartridge? The atmosphere, the gameplay, the characters, all in the palms of your hands. Oh. So it turns out Resident Evil 2 doesn't translate well to the GameCom. The first screen it starts you on is within inches of a zombie, giving you no chance to even get used to the controls. Basically, if you haven't played the game before, you're most likely dead 
instantly. After figuring out the controls, I was able to get past the first screen, but the tank controls that they carried over do not work well at all with the D-pad. You rotate your character to face a direction, and then up makes you go forward, as usual, for Resident Evil 2 from back then. Problem is, the delayed input makes this frustrating, to put it mildly. I also had a hard time figuring out if I was even facing a zombie to shoot them. It's another miss for the GameCom, and with the last game I have left being Wheel of Fortune, that might end up being the most playable game next to Lights Out. And with all the games out of the way, now we can go ahead and take the thing apart. Let's start by taking apart one of the games. I figure there isn't too much to see inside the cartridge, but we're this far, so why not? Only two Phillips head screws holds it together, and inside is a very basic board with a glob top directly at the center. Now, a glob top is a reference to the use of an epoxy to cover and protect a fairly naked die with traces or wires going to it. You can view it as saving space on the board or even saving money on parts. Either way, it's fairly annoying for what we're doing here since there's no part number on the chip to see. Now, moving over to the GameCom, the entire back is covered in Phillips head screws along with a CR2032 battery behind a small door. After going around and removing these screws, there are also clips that need to be pried apart to get the front off. Once inside, things get a bit cramped since they opted to solder the speaker as well as the contrast dial to the board and screen. I decided to desolder the screen cables in an attempt to give myself more room to get the screen lifted out. Once the screen was out of the way, it becomes pretty obvious why I was having such a hard time getting this thing apart. There are full-size capacitors on the back of the screen that had to fit a certain way inside a plastic shell. I assume this entire board for the back is used to put a picture on screen, while the ribbon cable controls the digitizer on the front. The digitizer, of course, recognizes when you touch the screen, and this is definitely an old variant and is huge, making the screen way thicker than it needs to be. I have a feeling if they didn't use a digitizer, the system could have actually been thinner. I also noticed everything is pretty much soldered with no clips being used at all. This is actually fairly common during the mid to late 90s, so I'm not really surprised to see this. Looking at it from this perspective, it actually reminds me a lot of the Game Gear's internals, but keep in mind the Game Gear used an entire CFL tube to light its screen, taking up a ton of space and requiring more power. While this is also large because of the screen, it's mostly because they opted for a touchscreen rather than a backlight. There's unfortunately not much we can identify when looking at the board since the chips are all covered in epoxy. We do have a few specs for the system, however, it was never officially disclosed. The GameCom appears to use a Sharp SM8521 8-bit CPU and has clocked anywhere from 1 megahertz to 10 megahertz with the consensus being it sits right at 4 megahertz to save battery power. Looking over what little we have for specs, it does appear the GameCom is actually weaker than the Game Boy while attempting to push a higher resolution screen during gameplay. This could explain the terrible performance and badly delayed inputs during gameplay. The one clever part about the system that I will give Tiger credit for is the way they created a stacked screen with a digitizer in a gaming handheld well before even Nintendo did. Looking at the design, they appeared to use pin headers underneath and a ribbon cable wrapping around the side to make this happen. Those pin headers plug into a socket on the board fastened to the screen so it fit in snug during assembly. It's an interesting way to save space before we were using full ribbon cables and LCD displays. At the end of the day, the GameCom ended up being a commercial failure, selling less than 300,000 units in total. Tiger even attempted to introduce a revision later on at a cheaper price of $30 with a backlit screen. However, it was too late since the Game Boy was flying high with the biggest IP ever for handheld systems being introduced the year prior in Pokemon. In 2000, the GameCom was a officially discontinued. The GameCom itself did not execute ideas well, which is unfortunate because the one thing Tiger did have were ideas. The touchscreen, idea to introduce a full menu system and online functionality are all things we enjoy now with handheld systems. In this regard, it actually reminds me a lot of the Dreamcast. The GameCom was a system that was forward thinking but couldn't execute or even stick around long enough for the market to catch up.